The conversation you're about to listen to is part of our Table Talk series. Our team goes in conversation with experts to explore microdosing in depth and from multiple angles. Today, my co-host Brittany Lilligard and myself, Jacobien van der Weyden, will explore microdosing in the light of ancestral wisdom with social ashi. Social Pusikoi Ache has been a teacher, mentor, and ceremony facilitator for the last 25 years. At 16 years old, she became the first female of five generations of men to be initiated, initiated in the healing tradition of her Peruvian ancestral lineage. For the past 24 years or so, she's apprenticed under her godfather, a Mesotec medicine man of the healing tradition with santitos or psilocybin mushrooms. She founded the Tiona Center for Ancestral Plant Medicine, an indigenous women-owned retreat company that offers legal Mazatec psilocybin mushroom retreats in Mexico. Socho is on our team as a facilitator and educator on our six-week program. And in addition, we are so grateful for her guidance in helping both our participants as well as our team to learn how to honor the indigenous wisdom that we stand on. This is literally the foundation of all plant medicine work. We feel this is an incredibly important topic uh, that we intend to explore much deeper, including today on this podcast. So if you are listening, thank you for tuning in. We hope you'll enjoy this conversation. And thank you, Social, for being here with us today. Mm, it's truly uh, an honor to, to be here with the both of you doing this work. So such important work um, that the Microdosing Institute has set out to do. So such an honor to be a part of it. Yeah, great. And so for those who don't know you yet, um, could you tell us a little bit more about your personal history? Um, what was it like to grow up as Socho? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it, it's it's really an interesting thing because... Nowadays, um, you know, plant medicine um, is like a topic of conversation at most awesome parties. And yet, when I was growing up, we really had to be very careful and um, kind of secretive about it. Because um, it, even though growing up in uh, between Mexico and Peru, um, there was a lot of stigma, uh, about these medicines and, and, um, and how they were seen in the larger communities. Obviously, uh, you know, within, um, my community, like my family, really, um, we would, you know, if, if the family, somebody got sick or, um, we were having prob emotional um, problems within our, our family structure. We would do ceremonies together. So growing up was very different, um, I think, from a lot of children that other children that I grew up with, because um, my family would do ceremony um, together. You know, so a, a ceremony um, would be with my grandparents. Uh, my godfather would come, my father, um, my nieces would be there. So, you know, these these plants were definitely part of our our spiritual path and as guides. Um, but, you know, this isn't something that was um, normal because I did grow up um, in a small city. So... It wasn't uh, what my friends were doing at school. Um, so in many ways, you know, um, I, I was uh, kind of proud of because I was I was given, you know, that um, wisdom and was also told what a what a privilege it was to work with these plants that not everybody got to work with these plants and heal with these plants and, and also get to know these ways so intimately. Um, for me, it was not just having faith in, in magic. You know, when people ask me, like, 
how was it as a young person to to be introduced to these plants? Because my first, uh, my initiation into um, being a medicine woman was at 16. And um, it was with plant medicine. And, um, you know, I get questions of like, well, how was it? How, how was that experience for you? How did it shift your life? And the one way that I can explain it is that it, I always had faith that um, there was a, a world of, of, I call it magic, a world of miracles, like a world um, where we are connected to plants, we are connected to animals, um, like that they even talk to us, you know, like I always knew that that was possible and like I wished it so hard. Um, and in my first plant ceremony, this was confirmed as real. And it, it restored my faith in, in life, in the world, in everything. Um, that magic was true, that, it, that we could live on this plane and be in this beautiful harmony. Um, not just walking the human path, but walking a path where we are assisted all the time by multiple sources you know the the energy of the earth our ancestors who have passed that are still here watching out for us plants and the way that they're constantly um showing us how to heal animals and how they're watching out for us and say, sending signs so all of a sudden this world that i knew was possible that you know my my elders had talked about um and I had, I had faith in all of a sudden with my first experience in plant medicine, it was like, wow, like I saw it, I felt it, I experienced it. Um, and yeah, so, you know, to, to be a young person and growing up with that is definitely shifts the conversation that you're having with your high school friends. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can imagine. And actually I, um, I, I'm really curious because, you know, in your bio, it says that you became um, a medicine woman at the age of 16. And I think a lot of people, when they probably hear that, especially in all co our culture, probably, you know, blink a couple of times, um, especially in a society where we're not allowed to drink until we're 18 to 21, depending on where we live, etc. cetera. And um, I think a person at that age, oftentimes in Western culture is not viewed as someone who is ready for those types of um, experiences. So I'm just curious if you have um, some additional insights on uh, just having that ability at a younger age than what um, we typically would view as appropriate, let's say, for um, experiencing these types of plant medicines. Yeah, well, Right away, it was I was never expected to be a medicine woman and carry that path in order to heal other people, right? It was, it, I, I was always at choice. So I think that that's important, um, especially because when we see um, these these uh, lineages, right? Like that, that there's folks like me who grew up with parents, grandparents, great-grandparents who carry these lineages, um, sometimes we see these um, as obligations. Um, but my father, he was very, very aware that he never wanted to put that obligation on me. And I think that that's something that um, I'm really grateful for. It doesn't always happen in families uh, that carry lineages. Uh, but, you know, he... He was highly influenced um, by the movement of the 60s, you know, the, the hippie movement. And so um, I kind of got a hybrid dad in that, you know, he was medicine man, also like very much like revolutionary hippie. Um, and, and he became a, a feminist and, um, you know, vegetarian. And so I grew up with a very, very, even, even, um, I would say different experience that than people who uh, fo indigenous folks that have um, 
inherited these lineages in many ways. Um, so his, his really like commitment to me as a young woman was that um, you are going to get initiated into these ways, um, but you are not obligated to follow this path. So, you know, I studied film and theater and art. Like I was allowed to really um, experiment to see what I wanted to do in my life. And I think that that was what, what, um, what became something very healthy between my father and I, because um, I had to choose later on the path of, of being a medicine woman in service. Right. Um, because it, it, it wasn't, um, I wasn't obligated. It wasn't, it wasn't something that, uh, that I had no choice about. And I, I can say that I was definitely very reluctant for a long time. Um, and that's a huge, you know, that's an, an, a whole big part of my story. Like the, re the reluctant medicine woman, because, um, I had seen a lot of, other med not not my father or my grandfather but you know because we were a medicine family that I knew a lot of other medicine people and what I didn't like was that uh medicine people sometimes were put in a pedestal and what there was this dysfunctional relationship um that people uh looked at medicine people as um the only ones that could help them cure themselves. And I felt like that was a heavy load to carry. And it wasn't one I wanted to carry. And it wasn't until years later that I myself had to go on a path. And, um, you know, I moved to the U.S. and became very passionate about um, psychology, personal development, um, trauma and and just went all in and learned through that you know like the western approach through healing um that we we have the power to heal ourselves and so i always appreciated medicine people who who didn't take on that like kind of um guru persona and we're, you know, but we're more about the message of like, no, 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 I'm just here to remind you that you can heal yourself. And so when I saw that, that's what my father was always doing. And that's like, that's what my grandfather was always doing. And I was like, oh, I like that. I like that path. Like if I get to do this and this is actually about me um, being a support for someone and in their realization, like their, their own self-realization that they can heal themselves and that they themselves have the power, then then, yes, I'm all about it. This is fun. I want to do it. Um, let's do the, you know, yes, I'm, I'm, I want to be that medicine woman. And when, when that became um, the way that I saw healing, then I was a complete yes. And that's when I fully went into my path. Yeah, that's really beautiful. And also um, a, a lot of parts about your story that I had never heard before. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, you've also sort of already opened the floodgate for, for a few interesting questions that we're really excited to ask you about um, here shortly. But one that I'm really curious um, to hear just a little bit more about, and you've already opened the path for it a little bit, but you're referred to as a curandera, um, and my apologies if I didn't quite get the uh, pronunciation there correctly, or medicine woman. And I'm just really curious, like that term, how do you hold that term? What exactly does it mean for you? Because I know um, these terms such as medicine woman, kulrindera, shaman, wisdom keeper, healer, um, they have so many different meanings to different people. So for you, what, is, what does that term mean? Yeah, well, it embodies um, respect and honoring to my lineage. And um, so I really don't like the term shaman. And a lot of people um, 
would want to call me a shaman just because of the work that I do. And I do not call myself a shaman. Um, do we do shamanic work? I think it's like the term shamanism is now so well known in, in the West that it's hard to really explain certain things without using it. But the title shaman is one that um, is, is been very appropriated and people um, use it for all indigenous um, wisdom teachings. So I am a Pampa Misayok. A Pampa Misayok is somebody that through my tradition, so through my Peruvian tradition, uh, a Pampa Misayok is, um, I've been initiated uh, in, into the, the healing tradition of, of my lineage. So when, when you get initiated, you become a Pampa Misayok, or they also call you a Paco. Um, so I am these, uh, I, I could use these terms. Um, another, uh, another term in, um, you know, each, each tradition has, each indigenous group has their own words that they use to name um, the folks who are through lineage or through uh, apprenticing for many, many, many years have gained the, the name um, that they that they, they name their medicine people, right? Um, so because I work in the West um, and people don't know the term like Pampa Misayok or, or Paco, um, I use the word medicine woman because then they know that I am a person that holds certain knowledge. I'm a, a, a wisdom keeper of that knowledge. Um, and so that's the one a uh, title that I, I I have loved and and so I've decided like I feel really good and comfortable using that. I don't feel comfortable using the term shaman, which a lot of folks have wanted to give me and so that you know and how I I um I have switched that conversation. It's like yeah, let's use medicine woman. It's just to me it, it just feels better. Um it's it eliminates um, me becoming part of the unconsciousness that happens when we um, when we're talking about these ancestral teachings and and not honoring where they're coming from. Yeah, and I'm I'm really looking forward to digging into this specific topic in a little <laughs> bit more depth uh, in a bit yeah. because I think it's um, I think it's a conundrum that we face in the psychedelic space, and I think it's something that um, a lot of psychedelic leaders um, either could be a lot better at or don't quite know how to um, step into in the best ways. But before we get there, um, I'm also just really curious to hear a little bit more about your backgrounds. Um, as a medicine woman, um, what was it like growing up in this lineage of all men, which you've kind of um, mentioned a little bit, but I'd like yeah. to hear just a little bit more about that. And also, um, I believe you have some uh, connection to Maria Sabina. So yes. uh, I'd like to just hear a little bit more about how that all comes together. Of course. So yeah, I, I talk about um, that I'm the first woman of five, five generations of men. I make this distinction because um, in my family, even though there are other medicine women, they never considered themselves medicine women. Um, but, you know, like my grandma was a powerful medicine woman, but she'd never practiced outside of our family. And so we see that there are so many uh, wise women um, in all of these traditions, but they don't practice to the public. They really practice just with their families. Um, so I wanted to really bring that consciousness because uh, in my family, I'm the first one that's actually like practicing outside of, you know, just the family unit. Um, actually taking the wisdom that I learned from my lineage and into the public and sharing it into the public. Um, it, 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 you know, I traveled to Peru uh, five, 
is it five almost well it's gonna four four and a half years ago to study with some of my teachers um our initiations our important initiations don't happen um through other other teachers what they they actually like they say in in my tradition that you when you get initiated it's like the mountain has to initiate you so it's not a human initiation it, it, it's an initiation that is done through these body these bo- important bodies like the apus the mountain spirits and so um when I was uh, back home, you know, my family, uh, we immigrated to Mexico. So I grew up in Mexico and, and I wanted to learn from other teachers besides my family. Um, and so I went to uh, Cusco and to be in the Andes. And um, I was really looking for female teachers. I really wanted to learn for female teachers. And it was so hard to find female teachers Um, because in, in my tradition, like in, in many indigenous traditions, you don't see a lot of women um, that are out in the public practicing. And so it was important for me to make this distinction that like, yeah, you know what, like out of five generations, I'm actually the first woman who's out here and there's not that many of us. Um, and there needs to be more. And so that's what was so important to me about um, emphasizing the, the lineage that I carry and how um, I, I want more women and that I am the first in my, in my personal lineage. Did I answer that question? I just... Yeah, you definitely did. And I... Um, uh, and, and I'm, I'm really grateful to hear this full perspective. And I think it's really interesting to hear that, um, you know, there's more women than we realize, but that it's just not publicly done. And that's not something that I was necessarily quite um, aware of. Um, the most well-known uh, Indigenous woman is Marine, Maria Sabina. Um, and she was probably the, the first sort of public um uh, indigenous figure in the Western world when it comes to plant medicine to begin with, male or female. Um, and I know that you do have a little bit of a connection to her. So um, I yeah. would like to hear about that. Of um, course. So my father um, is best friend. His best friend is my godfather, Ugo Matayani. And I met Ugo when I was 19. And he came to do ceremony with my father and this is the first time that I was introduced to Ninitso, the Santitos, the Teonanakati, the mushroom medicine. And he would come to our home to visit us from Huautla de Jimenez, where he is from, because he's a Mazotec medicine man, um, every year. And so with my, you know, and we would do ceremony with him and my, like I was saying, our, our ceremonies were always family ceremonies where we would sit with my grandparents and, um, the whole family. Uh, and, and I think that that's something that a lot of people, um, don't know, but these are, these, these medicine ways were always done with family. Uh, you know, everybody, as many people were included for our healing. And so uh, Ugo um, comes from Huautla de Jimenez. And he, when he was 11 years old, he was, they didn't know what was happening with him, but he got extremely sick and um, he went to multiple doctors. They finally um, discovered that he had leukemia. And um, living in Huautla de Jimenez, of course, at the time, um, Maria Sabina was alive. And she was friends with Ugo's father. And um, after s- visiting several doctors who basically said, there's nothing that we can do for your son. And, you know, he didn't have much time to live. They gave him about a year. Um, his Ugo's father decided to take him to Maria Sabina because, you know, they were friends. And she, he knew that, um, you know, she was she was a really good 
um, medicine woman and, she, you know, the, the Santitos were very healing. So they took him to a total of five ceremonies um, at 11 years old and nothing. Uh, he would just be in ceremony and he wouldn't feel anything. He wouldn't feel anything until the fifth one. He just like, he's, he says that he was just like sitting there and all of a sudden he just fell out of his chair and woke up like who knows how many hours later and um, was basically completely healed. So uh, after that, you know, they took him to the doctors and it was verified that he didn't have the leukemia anymore. So after that, because he was fluent in both Spanish and Masotec, Maria Sabina would ask um, his dad to let Ugo come into the ceremonies to be her translator. So he was translating for Maria since he was pretty young, 11, 12, 14. So it went on like that until, um, you know, she would, she would just, teach him a few things and she and he was just always in ceremony with her um translating and so later on he you know when he was a young man he decided to become a nurse because he really was into this healing thing um and a nurse was kind of like the 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 quote unquote like civilized path to take in healing so he became a nurse but he had this, he had developed this relationship with Maria um, because of, you know, he be, she basically saved his life um, and was uh, her translator for many years. And so, um, you know, he, he started uh, learning more and more until like in many ways, like me, you know, he had to live his own life um, as a nurse and travel and, and, and go to the city. Um, but then he himself decided to, to pursue the medicine path too with, with the Santitos and um, became a medicine man himself. And so he had already, you know, he's about the same, he's an elder now, um, about this, a little bit older than my father. So he's now in his seventies. Um, and he really carries the tradition in, in such an honorable way. Um, and it's been my ultimate pleasure to study with him and now work uh, side by side with him. Um, Cause he's ultimately family now. He's my godfather. And um, I've learned so much, you know, these, um, the Masotec really, were able to survive really i mean that's what you can call it survive um through so much and and keep these ways alive i mean it's it's really a blessing that uh they lived in Huautla de Jimenez which is um high up in the mountains and at that time there was no gold or precious minerals that you could mine there. So, you know, the Spanish kind of left it alone. Um, but you do hear, you know, you do hear because these indigenous traditions had to survive. Um, they, they mixed, they mixed with Catholicism. So sometimes even in the Masotec songs, you hear, um, you know, like, uh, translation would be like praise Jesus kind of thing, you know? Um, so there is a lot of that mixing, but yeah, so that's, that's um, the story with, with Maria. I mean, I, I never met Maria because I'm a lot younger and, you know, she, she passed by the time that um, I started on this path, but I, I do feel her essence in that Ugo carries a lot of her teachings in such an honorable way. And, you know, I hear stories. She was really funny. She was a funny, funny, funny character. Um, a lot of humor. And he carries that too. And um, I find that the best teachers are really funny and don't take themselves very seriously. And those are the ones that I, I like to learn from and, and um, teach with. 
uh, I hope that one day I become as funny <laughs> as they both were. But yeah, she, Maria Savina was, was uh, known to be very funny. She, she had, she was great humor. Um, and, and Ugo does too. And yeah. So, and yeah. Hey, and, and that connects so beautifully, right. To, um, uh, the spirit of the mushrooms, like, Many of us know that they're often called los niños, or mm -hmm. the, 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 of, of 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 so many plant medicines that the world knows. These are the most playful ones. Um, so that is that that might be a, a beautiful synchronicity or not. Um, and also leads me to the question. Um, well, not really a question, but maybe you can just talk a little bit more about um, what is medicine and. Is that, you know, um, we know this tradition now from Maria Sabina, we know it mostly for um, the work with the, with the mushrooms, um, but there are other uh, non-psychoactive medicines too, right? So yeah. yeah, maybe you can complete that picture a little bit more of what medicine is. Hmm. Wow, that's a huge, that's a huge, uh, okay. My my definition of medicine is is that it's a gift. It's a gift that um, we get to support us on our path and evolution. From it, it's a gift from from Mother Earth, from Tonatzin Pachamama. Um, I I believe that this this physical incarnation on Earth is not always the easiest. Yet it's um, one of the most potent ways that our spirit grows and expands. Um, and we get to do life with plants if we choose to, if we're so blessed, if we're lucky, if we, right? If we have that privilege. Um, some folks don't. And yet they do, even when they don't know it. Plants are always here to help us. Um, I really love that in in our tradition. Um, so there's this, uh, you know, um, co like there's a cosmo vision of um, how we believe life is. So through colonization, it, it, there was a hierarchy of intelligence, which is like, first it's humans, the most intelligent, um, then it's animals, then it's um, plants, right? And I think it's completely turned around. It's actually the most intelligent it, are plants. And then animals and then we're actually the last ones um and so plants are so incredibly intelligent and tapped in that when when we can access their intelligence which is what plant medicine is um there really are no limits into how we can access ourselves. And really that's, you know, a lot of people think that plant medicine will just, you know, it'll, it's like you'll go into a plant medicine session and boom, you'll be healed. And it's like, yeah, sometimes that happens. And also sometimes the plant medicine won't, it's not like an instant healing, but what it does, it, it gives you access to you, to your, intelligence right and it connects you to the plant intelligence and when we're connected to that intelligence um we can truly understand how to heal ourselves and what we need to come back into right relationship into balance i mean that that's just like a little um grain of salt to an ocean a whole beach of what this conversation is <laughs> that was a big question Jacoby. 
Well, I thought you answered it beautifully. And, um, you know, one of the things um, as a guide on our six week program, um, you often help a lot of our students reflect on the microdosing process that they're going through. And one of the things that I appreciate so much um, about your reflections is that someone can offer up a reflection that is seemingly disconnected from nature. It's very um, person driven and somehow your reflection always circles back to connecting them with nature, with plants, with animals, with, you know, you'll ask them a question and then all of a sudden they're like, yeah, and actually this hummingbird came up. And then that's the thing that actually is like the message that they need to hold on to. Um, and so it's been really beautiful actually seeing this in action, seeing how nature as, as a whole beyond just psilocybin um, is a really beautiful medicine and teacher and how psilocybin um, can help connect us and open us up to hearing um, those teachings. Um, so with that being said, I would like to shift gears a little bit and actually talk about microdosing um, and talk about maybe um, how you view um, working with the plant medicines in various doses, how you've utilized um, small doses versus macro doses. Um, so yeah, I'll just leave that as an open-ended question. Um, what does microdosing mean for you um, in regards to working with uh, psilocybin? Yeah, well, I mean, I I really love this microdosing movement in many many ways, and I'm so happy that I get to be a voice in it at this moment. And we need more indigenous voices in the microdosing movement because the microdosing movement is really um, a movement that is like the the pioneer, right? Like like these medicines are ancient and they've been around for not just our generation, but like multiple generations. I mean, um, you know, the, the, between like ancient um, temples, um, codexes, we can date just with one plant, but also, you know, we, we can date like peyote, um, huachuma in, peyote in Mexico, huachuma in Peru, um, from codexes, from from carvings in stone, that we've been using these medicines for at least at least five thousand years, if not more. Um, and these medicines are ancient, and yet uh, because of everything that ha has happened in our humanity. Um, specifically with colonization, right? I talk a lot about colonization because um, this was the process of eradicating violently a lot of this knowledge um, through the world, um, especially in the Americas, uh, you know, and, and, and indigenous people of the Americas that um, have been holders of this knowledge and, and the knowledge of working with these plants. And so even though this knowledge has been so ancient, it is only now in the past, uh, I would say really microdosing um, has been in the conversation for the past, what, like six, seven years. And really, really um, finally with legalization in the US, the, the Netherlands now, you can, you can um, get truffles, uh, it's in the past, I would say, two to three years. And really this year, uh, because of the pandemic, I think the pandemic also helped it move move it forward because so many people were in their homes and were like, well, what do we do? How do we actually go on a journey without having to travel because of not being able to travel? Um, so the microdosing movement was the pioneer to bring it into our um, our culture, our you know into the Western culture, into into the magazines, into the articles, the podcasts, um, everywhere. And so now, like I said, you know, at the beginning of our podcast, it's like you can go to a, a great party, and that will be a topic of conversation. 
Um, and, you know, I'm not saying that this will be a topic of conversation because I'm in the party and people know what I do. But most people tell me um, when they find out what I do that I just meet um, like, oh, well, yeah, like, yeah, my my cousin is been microdosing or yeah my aunt started microdosing or we just gave my grandpa a microdose and you would never hear this um uh, before right so i'm grateful for that um i'm grateful that there's been access to information and i'm that's why i chose to work with you guys because i really love uh the integrity that you're holding and that integrity really comes from that you've decided that you wanted to have an indigenous voice in this conversation because um, it is needed. While microdosing, what it's done is that it's systemized, like it brought a system to, to how to take smaller qual quantities of this medicine, right? So now we have a system in place. We have choices. We can do... Um, everyday microdosing we can do every other day we can do every two three days we can do certain amounts and, and up it and you know so we needed these systems we we do need science um it is helpful and we also need this ancient wisdom and um while people think that microdosing is something new it actually isn't it's actually something really ancient but we just didn't have these systems that we have today uh, in in the Mazatec tradition um, and also other traditions in Mexico, um, we have historically kept mushrooms and honey and um, administered them when we needed to for healing for cer for certain things in small amounts. So if, for example, you would get a, a person that would come and uh, you know, you were helping them with something physical, not necessarily taking them into a full dose ceremony, but they were like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm suffering from, from, um, perhaps, um, a, a problem with my liver or, you know, there were, there's certain, uh, medicine people that just worked with phys the physical, you know, like everybody has a specialty, um, like I, I specialize in, in, in the emotions, right? Like, yes, I can recommend some plants to help you with your body, but if somebody is really suffering from something physical, I'll send them to somebody that works specifically with the body um, because you have to specialize. And so for somebody, you know, for somebody that was working with healing people and their bodies with herbs, this was part of their toolbox is, you know, you 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 have a problem with your digestion, your liver. Um, you get migraines. You know, there's a little bit of quantities of um, psilocybin that you would give. Uh, also, like if a child, one one of the ways that I saw it um, with other medicine people um, that he helped with healing um, ailments of the body was like if a child would come and. Usually how we saw it is like a child couldn't sleep. A child was crying a lot. Um, and it's like, what's wrong with them? We don't know. Like there's nothing physical that we have found. Usually we would call it susto, which is like um, the translation would be like uh, you got spooked, you know, like there was a, a susto. And really the, the Western translation is that it was a trauma that happened. And we don't see traumas just physical or emotional sometimes they're spiritual you know they children can see spirits sometimes and it, it could be scary for them so you want to support a, a child with susto you would give them a little tiny dose of the honey right so i'm just bringing this up because a lot of people um consider microdosing something new and it's like no it's always been around we just didn't call it that and now I'm really grateful that we have a system. And so why not include both worlds? Why not include um, the, the, the acknowledgement that microdosing is also uh, ancient and that, yay, we ha now have the science and, and we can, we can um, use the science to support us in finding 
the best uh, dosage and the best way to take it. And having this holistic approach, um, like, wow, you could either microdose and just look at microdosing as something that's going to support you for your anxiety and depression um, and physically. And you can also use microdosing as a way to support you with your connection to spirit because it is spiritual medicine. This, this, this specific fungi is spiritual medicine. It connects us to our spirit. And we see in, in my tradition, a lot of the physical sickness is really at the source of spiritual sickness. And so much of the earth right now, so much of humanity is suffering from spiritual sickness or disconnect to the earth, right? And so um, why not like use it for its full capacity? Why not microdose and use it for everything it has to give us? So that's why I, I, um, I really love sharing about, you know, how to connect with the medicine in a spiritual way to the spirit of um, when we're microdosing. Of course, everybody's a choice and you don't always have to do it, but why not if you can? Mm. Yeah, I think that's really beautiful. And I, I really appreciate um, the holistic viewpoint. You know, it's interesting in um, the six week uh, group program that um, you support us in, um, oftentimes our students come in with an intention that tends to be um, focused in one of the, the four dimensions we look at, spiritual, uh, emotional, mental, physical, but then oftentimes their journeys start to encapsulate all four of those things, even if the focus is, is on one. And usually we find that the, the root of fixing uh, something in one dimension actually exists in another. So um, I really appreciate you bringing up this holistic view. And my next question for you that I also think is, is really interesting and relevant, when people do high doses, it is much more common for them to step into that process um, as ceremony. And it's a word that we use a lot with higher doses. With microdosing, um, that's not as often the case. It sometimes is, but it's not as often the case. So uh, I'm really curious to hear if someone was wanting um, some very tangible ways to start to build a deeper relationship to um, mushrooms while microdosing. What are some ways that they could start to maybe create a more spiritual or holistic practice around it and, and deepen the um, the relationship and not just focus on the physical or mental aspects of a microdosing practice? I believe that how we can create ceremony with a microdosing is first the acknowledgement. It's got to be like an honoring and acknowledgement of that you are working with spirit, that this, this and all plants really um, have their own spirit, just like Brittany has her own spirit and Jacobian has her own spirit. And they're both beautiful medicine for me specifically as my friends. Um, each plant, you know, um, hikuri or peyote or uh, wachuma or, you know, uh, ayahuasca. Each one of these uh, master plant medicines have their own spirit. And so psilocybin has its own spirit. And just the acknowledgement of that, right? Gives you a whole different perspective. Um, so you're not just, it's kind of like if you, you know, I, I recently, um, I'm getting over a, a head cold and um, I don't usually use anything to, that's not natural to, to heal myself if I, if I can help it. Um, but I had a horrible headache. So my partner came and gave me some Tylenol. And so I was like, okay. So, you know, you look at Tylenol and you, you just take it. You don't think about like, let me do a little prayer for Tylenol and, you know, where does Tylenol come from? And right. <laughs> um, but I think that there's folks that um, that's how they use microdosing. Right. They just take it like it was Tylenol. 
And that's, you know, um, this isn't about like wrong or right in any way. This is just like, how do you want to engage? And so you can, you can choose to, to take microdosing, like if you were taking Tylenol, or you can take the microdosing and actually like the first step to having a ceremony or, or is the act, the actual acknowledgement that like, oh, wow, actually, this isn't like Tylenol. This is a, a spirit. Like this, these little particles that I'm holding um, are a spirit, are part of a spirit that connects me to something bigger, bigger than I, I can even really understand right now. And this thing that, that I'm holding in my hand has a level of importance in my life right now. And so when we hold something in importance, it becomes sacred to us, right? And so the first thing, first step is acknowledgement. And when we acknowledge things, then we, we have great gratitude. And when we have great gratitude, we hold things as sacred. And that's how you start any ceremony, really. You can't have ceremony without one acknowledgement to the gratitude that holds something as sacred. Yeah, I um, listening to you makes my heart just feel so light because you have this, um, uh, your voice when you speak about these certain things that are so important to you is almost like honey for me. So first I just want mm. to acknowledge that in you because I always learn um, so much and I always love um, hearing how heartfelt um, all of your sharings are. Um, so, uh, so just acknowledging, I mean, I think that's really beautiful and simple, just taking a simple little pause uh, before taking your microdose, just to acknowledge that it's something a little bit more magic than say some of the other substances that we um, choose to connect with throughout our day. And that's one of the things that I love hearing you talk about. You use this word all of the time, and that's the word magic. Um, and in fact, there's a quote that you um, have said that really, really, really uh, spoke to me. And that's when we honor the past, the future becomes magic. Um, so can you give a little bit of insight into what you mean about that and how we can use um, microdosing and even beyond microdosing into the macrodosing world? How can we use our connection to plant spirit to honor um, our ancestors? Yeah. So <clears throat> I want to talk about first, right, what is right relationship, right? So this is a term that a lot of um, indigenous uh, folks talk about in different ways. And so we've just like brought it into a general terms as right relationship. Um, in my tradition, we call it Aini, which is sacred reciprocity, right? Like that when, when we receive, we give, right? It's like this, this like give and receive that is, um, in, in, sacred circulation, sacred reciprocity, right relationship. So your, your question about the, the honoring the past and the future becoming magic really is about um, we honor the past because by honoring the past, we are in right relationship. So when when working specific, I mean, this could be on a bigger scale, right? But working with these medicines, um, we want to make sure that the energy of the medicine that we're working with is a clean energy, right? And when I say clean energy is that it's not weighed down by other things that you actually don't want anything to do with. So because these uh, medicines um, have been so carefully and so lovingly um, cared for by certain indigenous groups so that they could survive and we could have the knowledge. But because in reality, um, all 
plant medicines that we currently use, whether uh, right now, you know, we're microdosing psilocybin, the f- folks are um, microdosing ayahuasca, you know, um, iboga of Africa, like all of these plant medicines are ancestral medicines. They have um, been used in, in ceremony and sacred ways by indigenous folks. And um, because of colonization, they were killed. I mean, many, it, right now, you know, um, we see that there's a lot of like Instagram shamans, right? Like people that are like self-proclaimed um, medicine people because it's cool. Like it's, it's, it's a good thing, but you know, when my grandfather um, was a, a medicine man, he's passed now, like he had to keep it very secret because even, even, you know, two generations ago, it wasn't safe. You, you could, you could be discredited. You could be killed. You could be outed. Um, it wasn't until I, I believe 1968 here in the U S uh, people couldn't practice sweat lodge and, and, uh, you know, traditional native ceremonies. So these medicines come with a heaviness um, because now we're using them and there's access to them, there's information. But we are not, many, many people in this psychedelic space are not acknowledging that like, hey, you know, for us to be able to talk about them educate ourselves about them uh, and, and have this wisdom, it was at the cost of, of a lot of suffering, violence. And so we don't want that to be with our medicine. And so how we can be with our medicine in right relationship is by just like acknowledging. Like that's all, it, it's, it's crazy, you know, how it, it's like, it's made into such a big deal, but it's really like so simple. It's like just acknowledging the ancestors, like, thank you. Thank you to all the folks that thanks to them through everything that they had to go through, everything that they had to suffer. I get to have this medicine here with me today, right? And this isn't just like a, a conversation of indigenous people. I mean, we could extend this conversation to wise women of Europe, you know, the witch, the witch burnings, you know? So, I mean, this is huge, but we want to clean our medicine because our medicine is tied to that and we need to untie it so we can have clean medicine. And so by acknowledging the ancestors and everything that they had to go through, and it doesn't just have to be our own personal ancestors, but the ancestors that had anything to do with this medicine. Thank you. Thank you, ancestors. Thank you for everything you had to go through so that I could be here and have this medicine so that I can partake in this medicine today. Thank you. Thank you to all the indigenous people, right? Because when we feel this gratitude, then our actions also align with that. And by, by saying thank you, now we clean the medicine. The medicine is clean, right? And not only that, and so how is our future magic? It's because this is the fun part. It's like when we acknowledge the ancestors of anywhere we go to, when we go to some land that we've never been to, and, you know, we know, like, like when we go to a party and we know that the, the, the host loves wine, I might not drink alcohol but that host loves wine like i'm going to take a bottle of wine if we're in north america and we know that the indigenous people of that land love tobacco i'm going to get a little bit of like organic tobacco and every time i go to a new land that i've never been to i'm just gonna hold a little tobacco and say thank you ancestors thank you for for just allowing me to be here on this land and and partake in this beauty I, I, I bring an offering of gratitude and, and you leave the tobacco. You know, if you're in South America, that might be um, candy, flowers, you know, just bringing offerings. So you do that with the medicine, right? You say thank you because when you, this is the fun part, when you say thank you and you enter in this right relationship, then you have an entourage of ancestors who just want to 
help you and support you. And, and then life is magic. Like, you know, you are walking. Like, I know that when I walk into any place, like I got all my ancestors behind me, not just my own personal lineage, but the ancestors of the land that I am at, where I've already made my gratitude and I feel like I'm welcomed. I have like, you know, my plant ancestors, like all the plants that like I, I said hello to. I have the the animal kingdom and all of a sudden life becomes magic because everything here is to support you on your path. And that's really fun. That's when life gets really interesting and really quite delightful. I, I love listening to all of that. I loved seeing your energy uh, uplift to this really magical um, space. Um, and also you do have some humor. I know um, you were saying before, <laughs> like, I hope I can be as funny as her someday. You definitely have a very cute, adorable um, humor. And uh, yeah, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I do have a question that keeps popping a little bit um, shifting slightly away from the fun side, but yeah. I am curious because you've brought this up a lot that your ancestors, many, many ancestors, even, you know, people who have ancestors in, um, you know, the European uh, witches um, have felt unsafe practicing. So I'm curious as a modern medicine woman, have you ever felt unsafe um, practicing your practice? Um, and what can we do as leaders in the psychedelic space to make you feel more safe? Oh, thank you very much. I've been very blessed that uh, I haven't felt unsafe in practicing. I, I think for me, it, it wasn't feelings of unsafetiness with others as it is more of an inner personal journey. Um, for me, uh, becoming visible was huge. And I didn't know it, it actually um, was because of like fe ancestral fear of, of being visible in this space. It's really, you know, I've been in the space for a long, long time, but I've been very careful. I didn't start talking about plant medicine until actually, uh, I think it was four years ago that cannabis became legalized in the US, at least in California recreationally, that I started talking about plant medicine. I'm extremely careful, even how I run my business. Um, I am a legal facility in Mexico, uh, we have a specific permit that allows us to run our our um, medicine retreats that is given to uh, indigenous traditional practitioners um, of of medicine in Mexico. So not illegality in Mexico is also very interesting. Um, but I am very careful about um, how I conduct myself because I am a woman of color and you can't deny that, you know, even though, uh, I just actually posted something on Instagram, you know, it was 420 yesterday and, um, we are celebrating cannabis, which is another plant medicine that I have deep love and respect for. Um, but you know, who has profited from the legalization and who's still in jail, right? So we still see that there's a lot of injustice. Um, and so how I was, I, I didn't become really visible in this space. And I'm only really just becoming, I feel like I'm, I'm just becoming really visible this year um, because I feel safer in, in terms of, of legalization and um, just how, how, uh, you know, the, the conversation is more mainstream. Um, but if, if you want to keep indigenous folks safe in this conversation, it's really more about inviting them into the conversation. Um, I feel like uh, there's very few of us that are actually public. Um, you know, for me to be uh, visible also, 
um, I, I really struggled with like what can be shared and what can't be shared online and publicly. Um, a lot of these traditions, you know, uh, I'm really lucky that I come from a tradition in Peru, even though my heap is a little different, um, where like, you know, we, we behave in Aini. So if somebody, you, I, I think you and all, all the listeners have probably, um, have met people who, who carry the tradition, the, uh, the Peruvian tradition, um, and are not from the lineage because Peru is a lot more open. Peru, Bolivia, like in terms of teaching the traditions and even initiating people that are not from, um, are like, uh, born into the lineage, but there's other traditions where, um, if you weren't born into the lineage, traditions won't be shared with you. And really, this is because it, it was dangerous. And now I think what's happening is that people are really careful with it because, you know, there's been a lot of appropriation. Um, so it's, uh, it, you know, colonization still exists in the way that we're still behaving with each other. We're still doing a lot of healing. And I'm not talking about just us indigenous people, but people in general. Um, of all races are still having to heal from colonization. And um, so, yes, a lot of, you know, we, we do see a lot of, um, uh, you know, medicine, medicine people that are calling themselves medicine people. And they've only taken a, a training for, you know, two months in Peru and are ministering high doses of medicine, um, it's really dangerous because you're basically doing um, like spiritual surgery. You know, would you trust somebody uh, to do a heart sur open heart surgery on you that's only studied for two months? You wouldn't. Um, so if you want to keep indigenous people safe in the space it's really about um as easy as offering platforms like how you've you know you guys have offered me and and not only have you offered me but you've made me you know a partner in this and then um as a as a teacher and you know bringing people into the conversation more and more i think is, is really important and also um you know i'm at this moment, I'm not. I'm. I'm not saying that uh, it's something I'm proud of because I think we need more. Um, but at this moment, I I am the only indigenous woman-owned retreat company uh, for psilocybin. So while there are retreat companies that have indigenous teachers, which is great, I'm really happy about that. We are not at every level. Meaning like we're not owning the retreat centers as indigenous people. And I think it's important to be at every level. We can't just be teachers that are, that are um, invited in. We also have to own it. We have to own a piece of, of everything so that we can have a strong voice and in, in how, um, you know, important things like legalization happens. Um, yeah, these are really powerful times. I mean, as, as more and more legalization of these medicines happen across the world, we need indigenous voices because also a lot of these plants, you know, right now we're dealing with um, kikuri, the peyote, and it's, it's, a, it's a species that is, is disappearing because of too much harvesting. Like, we need to have a voice in that. Like, do we need to, you know, I don't think the legalization of peyote uh, Ha, uh, is necessarily a good thing right now. I think it's a good thing, um, you know, that certain certain uh, indigenous people can use it, but but not for the mass public until we can get that in in uh, in order and, and and we can save the peyote plant. Um, yeah, I hope I answered your question. You guys ask big questions. I'm I'm really trying to do <laughs> my best. For curious ladies, what can we say? <laughs> yeah, the same here. I feel like there's this this sort of tendency to yeah to zoom out and look at the bigger picture and the the bigger movements. But I think it's also the times that we're living in right now. You know, everything is so heightened, and uh, we see all sorts of extremes. And um, 
Yeah. And what just came up for me was actually when you start talking about the POT and about that there is an opening up um, happening, but at the same time, there's, um, yeah, that the, the world is still very, the, the world overall still has a very Western mindset and a very mental and cognitive approach uh, to all of this. Um, and, and, and so it feels like there is still not that much space for those indigenous voices and those that, that ancestral knowledge to really kind of trickle through and, 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 and be amplified as much as we would all like it. Um, I was wondering, do you, do you feel that the plants themselves play a role in any of these developments or do you feel like in your communication with the plants, with the fungi, um, is, is this something that you like see counseled uh, with the plants or with plant spirit? Or yeah, um, I was just in a in a like a, a a group of of different indigenous folks, and one of the elders she was saying that these plants um, have a life of their own, you know, and and we know this, like they want. There's no accidents like uh, that, uh, you know, I, I can only talk um, right now with with the platform. I can only talk for the plants that I have a, a deep relationship with. Um, and while I'll advocate for all plants because I love them all, um, you know, I also know my place. Like if I, if I have a plant that I specifically work with, I have their permission to to speak on their behalf. And so I believe that specifically psilocybin has been um, such a leader in, in this movement because um, it, it really, uh, it's easy to grow and it doesn't affect the environment. You can grow it in your closet. Um, it's, it's not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, saying, to do so if you're not in, in a legal place. Uh, but you know, it, it, it doesn't take away from, 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 um, from the land and, and disturb other species. Right. So I really think that it's, it's such a great, um, medicine in, in that. And, you know, I was hearing Paul Stamets, uh, in, in one of the conference I was at and he was, he was specifically talking about that, you know, about like legalization and, and, and the commerce of these plants and how psilocybin is really the one that's like such a good one because it doesn't have those uh, negative effects on, on land and uh, resources like many of the other ones do. Um, so I think that that's why psilocybin has been such the leader out of all the ones, all the plants, you know, because even with ayahuasca, we see that that's become a big problem <laughs> in, in the harvesting of it. And, and um, just everything that's happening also with like the, what we call the spiritual tourism in Peru. Right. So, yeah, I believe that the plants, they have their own council and they decide like, okay, who humans right now are really needing our help and they talk to us we might not know that they're talking to us and they're like hey isn't it time like have you thought about microdosing you know um and then they put ideas into our our, our minds and, and we're, we're like oh yeah microdosing sounds like a great thing you know, and then all of a sudden we're all having this thought of like, wow, I've been deadly afraid of losing control and doing a big ceremony uh, or a big dose. Because when I was in high school, I accidentally ate way too many mushrooms and had a horrible time. But microdosing, that sounds like a great idea. And then all of a sudden, people who would never get a chance to be introduced to these medicines or would never even open their minds to, to, to them are, are now like, um, really into it. You know, I'm, 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 I, there's a part of me that's like laughs a little, cause I know that this is the doing of the plants. 
Yeah, those whispers. <laughs> totally, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I must say, I've been really enjoying the conversation so far. Um, Brittany already said it. Um, I think there's something that really um, comes along with your words that is much more than those words. And um, I hope uh, the listeners today also feel that. Um, and yeah, before before we wrap up the conversation, um, maybe talking a bit more about the, the or not, just like uh, reflecting back on uh, some of the things you mentioned, like the magic and the decolonization and just the ability that these plants have to work with us and to have us remember our connection. Um, yeah, so many, so many holistic uh, viewpoints here that all come together. So I really enjoyed that. And just want to ask if there is one more thing or if there's anything that you feel like is missing or maybe an, a, a final notion or a final word uh, for the microdosing community uh, before we take off here. Mm. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, mm. I feel that these medicines return us back to our joy. Um, I'm aware that for many of us, these are really challenging times. We, and it's not just personally, the world is going through a challenging time. Um, these, are, these are the times that uh, all prophecies we're speaking about, like we're in it, we're in that prophecy, which is um, a time of a great shift for our planet. And it, it's, we're at that space, whether, um, you know, what world, what world do we want to create? That's that's the big question that is being asked over and over and over again. What world do we want to create? And it's not just like, um, what world do we want to create in front of us, but what world do we want to create within us, right? And so um, these could feel like very serious questions. And so when I say have fun is, is really like that is deep too. Um, because we can get caught up in the seriousness of these times because there's a lot of things that are very, very challenging, but the medicine is really asking us to have fun. And what that means is, can we find ways to connect to our hearts, to connect to our spirit, to find love in what we do? And, um, and that's really when we when 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 it is time to take our last breath. I think the question that we will be asked is, "How much fun did you have?" And if, if it wasn't a lot, that really would suck. And so it's our responsibility um, to create fun. And what I'm talking about is like not like unhealthy fun where you go out and like drink all night and then feel horrible the next day. You know, I'm talking about like healthy fun, which is like you go out into nature and take off your shoes and feel the earth underneath you and feel the gratitude that it is to be here, even if it's for just one little moment and how we are so supported um, by plants and animals and the earth no matter if we feel it or not at that moment I think that fun is feeling the support because when we feel safe we can have fun right if we don't feel safe it's very hard to feel fun so feeling the safety of returning into that womb the womb of, of mother earth by by meeting with her and these medicines support that process, connect us. Um, so having fun, let's not forget that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's have some fun. Absolutely, let's add some honey to our lives. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Social. Thank you so much for being here. And um, uh, really enjoyed this conversation and uh, looking forward actually to sharing this with our wider community. And um, yeah, one more time, thank you for all the work you're doing. And um, yeah, deep bow. See yeah, you soon. thank you. Thank you so much. If you've enjoyed this podcast and you feel ready to go to a truly successful microdosing process while also developing a deeper relationship with psilocybin as your sacred ancestral ally, this is a good time to look at our six-week microdosing program. What makes this program unique is that it offers a framework that allows you to go through an accelerated personal learning journey with your intention as a starting point. There are four pillars that facilitate this process of transformation. Number one, education and a scientific method of dosing, calibrating and tracking your observations, insights and challenges. Second, we offer an ancestral approach to earth medicines, transmitted beautifully by Mazatec medicine woman, Social Asia. And third, guidance from multiple angles, from your partner in the group, through one-on-one facilitation and the support from the entire group that meets weekly inside a safe, lovingly held container. And lastly, focus on active integration so that your insights will not sit around but convert into newfound values and concrete actions that will help you live the life you truly want to live. So if you feel ready for this exploration, follow the link in the description to apply for the six-week program here at the Microdosing Institute.